Thank you all so much. Let's give another hand for Racine real quick. The queen of BC. I love her so much. This year, as everyone in this audience knows, is the 50th anniversary of Stonewall. Thank you, trans women of color, for starting the modern movement for LGBTQ equality. We are forever in your debt. And it's also the 50th year that Sesame Street has been on television. <laughs> True story. I loved Sesame Street as a kid. I especially identified with Oscar the Grouch. I did, not because I'm grouchy, I'm just a little trashy sometimes, and Oscar gets me. But what I find interesting about Sesame Street is that it pervades popular culture. And there is no better example of this, in my humble opinion, than the, the debate over the sexual orientation of Bert and Ernie, <laughs> right? Because let's be clear, Bert and Ernie are a gay couple, yeah. right? And it's not because they said they're gay, it's not because they're affectionate in public. We don't know a couple, a couple is a couple in public because they're affectionate. We know a couple is a couple in public because they argue openly. <laughs> That's the best proof we have that Bert and Ernie are a gay couple, right? <laughs> so last year, Mark Saltzman, who uh, was a longtime writer on the show, gave an interview with a queer outlet in which he said he had no other way to contextualize Bert and Ernie's relationship than as a gay couple. And not because he sought out to make them gay, but because he based their interactions on his relationship with Adam Glassman, who also worked on the show, right? very innocent comment about the show in 2019 when marriage equality has been the law of the land for four years. So, I mean, this should, this should not have done anything wrong, right? And, and yet, that, that's very naive. Uh, because the internet exploded, and, you know, uh, there were op-eds flying everywhere about, you know, how it's, you know, infecting the young children of society. And it made me think a lot about art and what it means to children. I came out as a proud trans woman two years ago. I, thank you, thank you. I was in the closet for 30 years, and I did everything I can to conform to society's cisnormative, heteronormative expectations of me as someone who was assigned male at birth. I did it. You know, I played high school football, and you know, I served in the military, and I didn't really rebel as a kid. Um, because one thing that I hear constantly from some people who are rather misguided is that trans women in particular must have lacked a strong male role model. And that's the furthest thing, for me at least. I mean, not only is it just a stupid comment in general, um, but it didn't apply to me. I, I worshipped my father growing up. I did. I just, all I wanted growing up was, was his approval. And it's part of what drove me to, you know, uh, do good in school and be good at sports and join the military like he had joined the military, right? And I say all this because we were not very close. Because I took two steps toward him and he would take two steps back. And that is the summation of our relationship. And yet, there was one moment in childhood when that was not the case. It was my 13th birthday. He took me out to a Texas steakhouse, because I'm from Texas. And uh, that's right. Um, it was my official entrance into manhood. And this was supposed to be a really good moment for me. Particularly me, because I wanted his approval. He said he was proud, he gave me a watch. It was a really, should have been a great night for me, but something was missing. Because something had always been missing. Something was missing for the next 17 years of my life as well. Because my brain did not align with this, with the body I'd been given, right? And so, for me, it was just this constant sense of missing something and not knowing what that something was. Until I started listening to a particular song, uh, Trains, Drops of Jupiter. Now, do you all remember that? Yeah. Now there she's back in the atmosphere, drops of Jupiter in her head. Right? I love that song. I know it's a very syrupy ballad. I know it makes a lot of people's eyes roll for good reason, but the first time I heard that song in the summer of 2001, it was magical. And back then, you know, I couldn't afford CDs, and I didn't know how to do the whole MP3 business, which was, you know, pretty young back then. 
And so I would wait for it to come on radio or television, and I would be very happy and a little sad because I knew I couldn't play it again immediately. And so for my birthday, I got the CD, finally. And when I tell you folks that this is the only CD, or excuse me, the only song that I listened to for the better part of a year, I mean, this was literally the only song I listened to for the better part of a year, day after day, week after week, month after month. It's the third track on the CD. I don't know the other tracks to this day. <laughs> I have the CD in a box somewhere at my grandmother's house in Central Texas. I still have no idea what the other tracks are. People will be like, oh, you like this song too? I'm like, I, I haven't heard it, I'm sorry, I don't know. <laughs> I would listen to this again and again and again, over and over, and y'all, it was a sickness. 15 times a day, 20 times a day, 30, 40, over and over again. I would listen to it going to and from school. I would listen to it in between classes. I would listen to it on the weekend for hours at a time while I was doing homework, again and again and again, and no one else knew about this. I literally ran out of batteries and cried on the bus to school one day. 14-year-old crying over dead batteries. I cried over dead batteries, that was me. Because I, I so wanted to be the woman in that song. I so wanted to be the woman that Pat Monahan, the you know, lead singer of Train and the writer of the song was describing, talking about her journey through the universe and how she was you know, trying to discover herself. And I was like, yeah, me too, me too. But I didn't know how to do it. And for me, I couldn't rebel, I couldn't, uh, uh, get out of the line. I wanted so badly to please the adults around me that I lashed onto this song as the one thing I could hold on to. Pat Monahan wrote the song for his mother, who died of cancer. And we know this is 100% irrefutably true. Uh, this is a fact. Drops of Jupiter is a song about pa Pat Monahan's mother who died of cancer. It is not a song about a trans woman. But respectfully, for me, Drops of Jupiter will always be a song about a trans woman because it's the one thing that kept me alive through that time. I was suicidal, I was depressed, I couldn't talk to anyone about this, I didn't know the word transgender or gender dysphoria, I, I didn't know what was wrong with me, I just knew I wanted to kill myself and no longer be in this body, and that one song kept me going day after day, week after week, month after month. I still listen to it sometimes when I have a bad day because it reminds me that there's goodness in the world, right? And I think what's so interesting is that you look at this debate over Bert and Ernie, <laughs> and yeah, sure, Bert and Ernie are not a gay couple, right? I guess, sort of. Mark Saltzman was forced to do an interview with New York Times in which he was admitted, admitted in quotation marks, that Bert and Ernie are not a gay couple. We all know that's incorrect. <laughs> and he told the New York Times the puppets are an example of love, meant to help preschoolers through the issues of their young lives. A young boy in foster care who is sharing a bedroom with another boy. And yes, a preschooler learning what it means to have gay parents. It's like poetry. It's what you need it to be. In a way that's like all art. It's what we need it to be to heal ourselves and empower ourselves and just get through the goddamn day. That's what art should mean. Bert and Ernie are not a gay couple. Drops of Jupiter is not a song about trans women. But if this is what it means to people, if this is how they survive, who the hell are you to take that away from them? And so this is just a reminder to let people feel art the way they're gonna feel it. Let them embody themselves and imbue themselves with the art that's created because it, it may have not have been created for you in that specific purpose. Mind your own damn business. Let them be who they're gonna be as they're going through the universe on their own journey. And also listen to the song tonight because it's a damn good song. Thank you.